thank you so much for, for being here. I'm John Ruggie. Um, um, I teach uh, um, at the Kennedy School courses on global governance and business and human rights and corporate social responsibility. Uh, my colleagues, um, Rebecca Hummel um, is um, with the Chevron Corporation. She's a Kennedy School graduate. Um, she's worked in the State Department. Um, she's worked for USAID. She's been stationed in Afghanistan. She's done it all, um, which is what we like to see uh, Kennedy School students do cross-sector business, public service, um, and, um, and, and she's uh, agreed to join us uh, for our discussion here today. Thank you, Rebecca. Jane Nelson, um, well, I don't know, we could spend the next hour talking about Jane Nelson. Um, Jane Nelson was one of the founders of the whole concept and movement of corporate responsibility um, many, many years ago. Um, uh, she uh, um, was with the um, uh, Prince of Wales International Business Leader, uh, Leadership Forum, is that? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Uh, has worked closely with uh, the World Economic Forum, not the, more, more recently the Clinton Initiative. Um, and she uh, also teaches at the Kennedy School, and in fact we co-teach of course together in the spring um, on corporate responsibility. Um, we decided what we would do today is tell you a couple of stories uh, about the evolution of the relationship between business and society. Uh, but I'm supposed to start everything with um, a seven second. So, um, what 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 are what are we about uh, in 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 this um, uh, discussion this afternoon? Um, in the 1980s, 1990s, there was an outburst of globalization, outsourcing um, in the footwear and apparel industry, extractive companies going into new con contexts um, in Africa and Latin America that they hadn't been in before. Globalization um, became a powerful force transforming uh, the world. Um, and the spearhead of the globalization movement were multinational corporations. Um, multinational corporations and other kinds of business enterprises these days are beginning to find that there is pushback to that wave of globalization. And we see it here in the United States. Um, in, in issues related to um, outsourcing of jobs, income inequality, um, pushback against fracking and, 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 and the like. So um, in, in, in response to um, this societal pushback, which, which, which is global, um, um, uh, in fact, uh, when, you, when you look a, a, across the various countries of operation, um, companies are beginning to, or have begun to learn um, that standard operating procedures that worked in the past are no longer um, sufficient. Um, and new styles of leadership, witness Rebecca, um, are required uh, in the public sector and in the private sector, people who can actually bridge civil society, government, um, and, um, and, and the private sector. Um, and the Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative here um, uh, at the Kennedy School, of which Jane is the director, has focused on these issues and worked closely with businesses, with governments, with civil society organizations, with international agencies for the last decade. In fact, we're celebrating our 10th anniversary uh, this fall. Um, we've had a pretty significant impact um, on the conduct um, of all sets of actors. Um, among other things, um, the initiative uh, did all of the um, uh, research um, and the advocacy work for the adoption of the UN um, guiding principles on business and human rights, which are now the authoritative standards for companies and governments um, in this area. Um, we didn't want to talk at you um, today. What we want to share with you is, as I said, two stories. Um, one of them um, is um, focused um, on um, Chevron's learning uh, and what we learned from Chevron and our engagement with Chevron since the beginning of the Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative. And it illustrates new modes of um, social risk management by companies. How companies can focus on not doing harm in the social and environmental sense 
in the communities in which they operate. And this isn't just a gesture of goodwill. One of uh, Chevron's competitors, um, not so many years ago, lost $6.5 billion over a two-year period to what they described as stakeholder-related risk. Um, that is to say, uh, pushback from communities in which they operated, which lengthened uh, the period of time required for permitting, uh, resulted um, in the blowing up of pipelines, kidnapping personnel, all sorts of other stuff like that. That's the social risk management side. Um, the other side um, the, in which there is tremendous um, uh, innovation taking place is creating shared value. Companies beginning to look for ways in which they can grow and expand their own business while at the same time making a contribution to the societies in which they operate. Uh, and so Chevron is our example of um, uh, the, the new risk management approach. And Unilever, in its sustainable living plan, uh, will be our example of uh, the creating shared value uh, approach. So what we're going to do, um, um, we're going we're gonna to look at, at um, a, an award-winning video, and we have copies of the entire documentary for you. It's something we, uh, we uh, produced. It was paid for by the government of Norway um, um, as part of its support to the Corporate Social Responsibility Initiative here. Um, it, is, uh, it focuses on um, company-community um, dialogue and company-community relations. Uh, so we'll be uh, happy to share that with you. So we'll go through that video, and then um, um, Rebecca is our resource person to discuss the Chevron case. Um, and then we'll turn to a very short um, video on Unilever's uh, sustainable living plan. And Jane, will, one of the originators of the whole notion of creating shared value, uh, will lead us through that discussion. Now, um, I'm going to do this again, um, and, and hope it works. Okay, this is what I was just describing to you. Which is not so cute. <laughs> but, 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 but it makes the point. Okay, so shareholder value added on the horizontal, societal value added um, on the vertical. Right? We're in the Kennedy School, you got to have a two by two. Right? This is how the world works. Now, business as usual starts with compliance. You've got to comply with the law. You've got to live up to your own standards and, and codes of conduct, etc., etc. Um, the societal contribution in the business as usual model was philanthropy. Okay? Um, that's business as usual. Building competitive advantage, this is the new world that, that we um, have been encouraging and that company, some companies are moving into. The doing no harm, the risk management, okay? and then the creating shared value through new core products for bottom of the pyramid um, uh, consumers, new business models, more inclusive um, val uh, um, um, uh, value chains, um, and so on and so forth. So this is the sort of overall contextual, uh, or conceptual, I should say, framework um, for the two videos. And now I'm going to push this again, and we're going to go to Nigeria. I hope. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yes. Yep, it works. Right. We might want to turn up, yeah, the yeah. the volume a bit too. Get back on meetings you don't see government presence. No rules, schools are not there. Even the existing schools are dilapidated, the roofs are leaking, there are no furniture for the students and people to see, no dormitory facility. And so, the, the people now say, ah, but in our community we have oil, which which the economy of Nigeria is very wrong. Why must we suffer? If you are taking oil from our land, your flow station is here. There's no short of electricity for one second. 
Why can't you extend this electricity to our community? Why can't you extend this your water that you are drinking there to our community? Before the crisis, the community we're not saying the presence of Chevron. We just only know that Chevron took oil from our land. That is the truth of the issue. Chevron operated were like a cash handout system with the community leaders. And the community leaders, uh, to a large extent, were not doing anything with that. What they were doing were just appeasing the, the, the community leaders. That's what Chevron was doing. They didn't listen until, I think, 2004, uh, between 2003 and 2004, they suffered major damage. Well, about um, the middle of March of 2003, uh, we had a resurgence of ethnic crisis in the Niger Delta area where Chevron had its operations in the creeks of the Niger Delta. And it turned very ugly. Uh, many houses were burned, several people were killed. A lot of people were killed. Villages were at war with each other. It was, it was really a, 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 a situation in which we had war. So um, Chevron had to close uh, some of its facilities in the Niger Delta. We hoped that the conflict would not last too long and that we'd be able to return to, to the Niger Delta as, as quickly as we had left. Uh, but this turned out not to be the case, and uh, we were out for close to 18 months. It's difficult to uh, compute exactly how many people that were lost from our plan. Um, but I know that a good number of youths were killed. I think that the crisis of 2003 was really a game changer for everyone. We had never seen anything so violent. We could not imagine that uh, they could go to that extent. And in the time that we left the creeks, many of our facilities were destroyed. Uh, they, they got to a point where it became clear to them that they had to do things differently. Mindset was, you know, let's do something for them. We we can sit around a conference table and we can figure out what we want to do for them, and then we go out and deliver this this these benefits, this largesse for the uh, for the, the community. Well, there are lots of companies that are well-meaning, but don't understand the process of development. So they think, oh, they need schools, they need hospitals. We can do that. We can build them a school. We can build them a hospital. We lost a number of the things that we had provided for the communities. We, we had built a hospital twice, which was burnt down during this conflict. We had built many schools in the communities which were destroyed during the conflict. So what was the point to providing all these uh, facilities if it would end up being destroyed? It was a Chevron hospital. It was a Chevron school. It was a Chevron facility. We have to do the things differently. We have to find a way to make uh, for peace. Those things were never thought of being owned by the community from day one. They always thought it was owned by the person that did it, in this particular case, Chevron. If they were part of the process and they were key in putting those things in place, it's never happened. They won't destroy their own, they won't destroy their own building that they put there. We felt it was time to look at things in a more comprehensive and holistic manner. Partnerships. We present this as the game chain from a, a bilateral relationship to a multilateral relationship that recognizes the role of government, the role of the non-governmental organization, the civil society, and also that recognizes the role that we as a company could play in terms of brokering peace and encouraging uh, conflict resolution through peaceful means. Then we also said we need to have transparency. 
we thought, well, we have inadvertently created this impression that we are more than who we are. We are more than the company that we are, and that uh, we could fix all of their problems. Well, we can't, so it's about time we came clean and said, listen, there are many other people who we can bring on board, and we can all see where we can contribute to this enterprise. We need to have some sense of accountability as well. been a tendency in the past, particularly when people look at charitable approaches to assisting communities, to measure just what you spend. Because it was becoming clear that it's not a matter of just spending more or doing more. It was more a matter of, of doing better. We said another key element was ownership. They have been spending so much on community development, but they are, the, the Development is not seen. So they, they now think that it is good to hand over the development of the uh, community to back to the communities to handle. Something you must remember is when we talk about stakeholders, we also have to include other people within the Chevron organization who doubted this process. Are you sure we should be turning over these uh, tons of funds to community people who have never handled this? this kind of responsibility. Um, we are not a company. We're used to taking charge of things and doing things that needs to be done. We are not used to turning responsibility over to other people. The key element in all of this is a, a participatory approach. So we say, OK, look, fine. Do we continue to do that, go that route? Or do we find a way of expanding the table, of having other people participate? Or do I find a way of also having a participatory process where whatever comes out as the issue of the community actually presents majority of the community? There were some communities you dare not enter. Since they are always looking for space to air their views on their situation, what we did was to tell them that there is a need for your voices to be heard so that if your needs are addressed, you can drop this gun. Getting guns pointed at is an experience I'm used to. But I don't think it's something that makes any of us special. We are Nigerians. And knowing the work we're doing, it was important for their voices to also be heard in the process. We became more creative to the chairman. If we had not given it a try, we would have got to where we are. We actually had, for the first time, groups sitting in the same room that had never spoken to each other. Groups that had been involved in destroying each other's uh, uh, homes, in, in burning down whole communities, were sitting at the table and talking about one subject. And that subject was something that we put on the table. It was the GMO group. It was not going to be a situation of Chevron determining that we are going to build a school in this community. It is not a case of Chevron determining that we are going to hire contractor A to build that school. It's not a question of Chevron determining that this is how much we are going to spend on the school. It's a question of Chevron saying, well, we have one million dollars for this set of communities for this year. And that is negotiated and agreed to. Now, the use of $1 million will now be determined mostly by the community. The beauty of it is that the contractor is from the community, is known by the community, they were recommended by the community, so they were put every person. He knows the, he has the knowledge of the environment, he has the knowledge of the community, so these help him to deliver on the job. Some of the surprises that I saw actually came from Chevron because from internal to internal to Chevron there were people who felt that Chevron was not doing enough. And that was strange. 
it's contrary to the, the business concept of negotiations where you, you, you want to have an advantage over who you're negotiating with to get the best business deal. When in negotiations like this, you want everyone to be organized. The educated traders all how to negotiate to get what's inside, what is rightly for us. It's never going to work unless everyone wins. Development progress really is uh, in the progress made by people. It is not in projects. It's a journey. It's a process. I know that the people I met in 2005 have been transformed in many, many ways. There were people, some of them were people who were just coming out of war. They were raw warriors. Today, these are fine gentlemen who can sit down and negotiate anything with anybody. The chairman process has taught me that you need to relate to people. You need to talk to people for people to know your problem. It is only when people know your problem that you solve it, they can solve it. Now, when there are issues, people are not talking about we are going to destroy this whole thing. They are talking about let us find a resolution. The language has changed. I think it's groundbreaking. I think the demo is a groundbreaking. The lesson is listen to the people, hear what they have got to say. It's right for the people. Uh, it's right for the reputation of the company. It's right to improve the business of the company. And it, it, it's just the right thing to do for, for, for the people who are in the areas where we operate. For communities, my advice would be, what do you have to lose? Where you are at, believe in God. If you die and you get to heaven, there's no God. You've not lost anything. If there's God, you go to paradise. So what do you lose? Nothing. There's no, there's no problem in talking. So give a chance. See what happens. One must be a little humble in the sense that um, we work for big multinationals and we, we, we are all well read. We all believe that we are intellectuals. We all believe that uh, we know quite a great deal of things. And therefore, we know what's right for everyone. But we don't. And we, we only find this out when we listen, when we talk to other people, when we get involved in the communities where we operate. And we are the better for it, because learning makes all of us better. You see, uh, it was a successful um, journey. Uh, Rebecca um, um, is um, uh, here today to um, to sort of draw out some of the lessons, um, uh, help us um, uh, in um, uh, seeing the applicability of this model in very different kinds of contexts, including in the United States. So Rebecca, do you want to say a few words, and sure. then we can sort of throw it open. Sure. The other video is much shorter, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Um, so I definitely want to hear all of your thoughts and reactions. I mean, it's, there's so many powerful messages there, and just hearing from the people there on the ground, both those working at Chevron, but also, also in those communities, it's, it's quite a story and one that is ongoing. And Jane and I have been involved in that follow-on that you built a partnership initiative. So, um, but I do want to just take a moment to reflect a little bit of why I think that video is so powerful, and I think how it really is important and applies for Chevron globally. Um, you know, as John noted in his introductory remarks, companies like Chevron are on a journey as they think about what does CSR mean and, and where is it going, um, especially as, you know, we need to be finding ways to be more meaningful and responsive in such a sort of complex, dynamic, and interconnected world. So, uh, you know, and we, we are, we, Chevron, and many, many other multinational corporations are in tough places, and the company is on what I like to think of as a never-ending 
journey of continuous learning and improvement. Um, and it's hard. I mean, we luckily have experiences like the GMOU program to sort of digest and reflect and, and inform the way we think about what does community engagement really mean and how do we think about it in other places. Um, I think the word is used quite easily. We have community engagement advice all over the place, but it really means listening more than talking, right? Um, as this video showed, it's not, and others said in, in, in the interviews, it's not just the amount of money or what is built, but how, how it's done, and, and how you sit down and have that back and forth. Um, and build, build an environment and a forum for sort of decision making and disagreement at times. It's, you know, I mean, having an inclusive process is messy, and it's going to take time, and you're probably not going to be able to, you know, get that money out the door and, and, and build the sort of project the community wants in a, in a fast way, but it's probably going to be the most sustainable process and the sa most sustainable way for long-term community ownership and buy-in. I thought that was really powerful about the way he said, you know, they're not going to burn down something that they have a real stake in. And I've seen that in other times in my work in the past in other far-off places. So um, the other thing to point out is I think the GMOU program is one of many things that Chevron is doing in Nigeria. And I think it's really neat, you know, we've got this, um, a, a range of ways that companies are sort of investing in on the, on the sort of CSR side of things. And there's always going to be a space and a place for employee volunteering and some of the strategic philanthropy and social investment. And Chevron does some of that in, in Nigeria still. And we have these big health programs. But we're also looking at value chains and supply chains and local content programs to, to strengthen the capacity of local suppliers, which also benefits our business. Um, and we're also involved in a number of um, industry um, initiatives that focus on companies' relationships with security forces um, and also and the, the intersection between security and human rights, as well as how companies and governments sort of are more transparent about the way that revenue, revenue is managed. But it's also not just about the Edger Delta, and you know, this is a great case, but um, you know, Chevron is operating in, you know, all over the world. 180, 180 countries. Um, and we're, we're entering new business and new countries all the time. I and mean, we've got new investments in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Morocco. We um, have uh, additional new business in Myanmar. So, you know, taking these lessons and really thinking about the challenges in places like that is critical. But also here in the United States, I think very often in, you go to a CSR conference and they're going to talk about Nigeria or they're going to talk about Indonesia. We have challenges here in the United States at our Richmond refinery in, in Northern California. We had um, a lot of serious challenges with the community after a fire a couple of years ago. Um, and in Western Pennsylvania, where very sort of controversial shale gas uh, operations are underway, um, we've also similarly realized the need for real thoughtful and, and sort of authentic community engagement. So it's not just about the Nigerias of the world, it's about here at home too. So I'll just close by saying, you know, for a company like Chevron, it's also really critical to have partners and collaborators like John and Jane and others in the Harvard community. I mean, being a part of the CSR initiative since its founding nearly 10 years ago has been a really, a really great experience. And for me personally, to kind of come back home in this new role with Chevron is really neat um, because I think and again, it's sort of personal for me, but bridging the sort of public and private sector divide is, is so critical. And I think HKS does a really great job in creating a space for students to, you know, be familiar with all pieces of society and realizing that the most success and the problem solving is really when you're, when you're working across and with multiple partners. So at that, I will, I think we're opening it up for comments or yep. questions. And Please. And thank you, Rebecca, for being such a, an emblematic um, alum. <laughs> thank you. So the floor is open, please. Yeah. Tell us who you are. Okay. Uh, I'm Deborah Decker. I'm at the Stimson Center working on uh, public and private governance of uh, illicit trafficking models, and if we can internalize some of the externalities of that. But looking at this case in particular, I, I was struck by what Professor Ruggie said about looking at new modes of social risk management by companies. And so one of the things I'm looking at is how do you 
change the, some of the liability frameworks so that there is a liability for not doing the right thing. And in this case, <coughs> would, would Chevron, for example, have done so much if it didn't, if, if there hadn't been an, a, a, you know, aggressive opposition, things getting burned down, all, all the negative outcomes? And when I look at like the BP oil spill, and I compare that to the Exxon Valdez, you know, BP tried to do the right thing, look what happened to them, and, you know, where should you have another company who takes a different approach, it's like, I'm just going to fight everything, you know, and I, I would have to pay out. So, just wanted your thoughts about what's, the, how do you, you know, you see clear costs, and so you have to invest to avoid the, the risks, but does, does that, you know, always work? So BP was trying to do the right thing in one case, right? I think it was to compensate, you know, but what's your well, it, 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 BP then ran into a bunch of Louisiana plaintiff lawyers. Right. <laughs> that, 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 I don't think that's a generalizable, I, I, I hope it's not a generalizable case, uh, but it certainly is true um, that uh, they sort of encountered a buzzsaw uh, having tried to do the right thing. Um, on on your, your opening comment, I think you're absolutely um, Right, that you know what happens is historically, um, ever since the Industrial Revolution, um, economic and technological forces have outpaced the ability of society to manage the consequences. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. There, there's a, there was a PBS series on Queen Victoria recently, which I just happened to catch one night on, on you know the the, the most powerful, the richest empire in the history of the universe, and people were sleeping in the streets and not having enough to eat because the social institutions hadn't yet adjusted to the, the, the fundamental economic and technological changes that had been produced. Uh, our job, as I see it, is, is to close those gaps. Um, and and it, you know, um, laws do catch up um, if, um, um, uh, to, to uh, these kinds of uh, situations. So for example, um, it, you, you mentioned Myanmar. Um, the, the U.S. Um, um, lifted sanctions on Myanmar, uh, but decided at the same time to say, but you know what, um, we're going to impose reporting requirements on American investors uh, in Myanmar. Anybody who invests more than $500,000 annually, you've got to report on the social and environmental consequences and the human rights consequences of your investment and tell us what your risk management strategy is. Uh -huh to deal with those sorts of things. That's a small example. Uh, the European Union just adopted um, um, legally binding requirements for companies to report uh, on their non-financial, um, on, on their non-financials, so that they have to do environmental, social, and, and human rights reporting. Uh, the, but the, the, you know, as I say, the gap is, it, it, it's been there ever since the Industrial Revolution, and it, it, we're, we're learning that the Chinese in Latin America and, and even in Africa are beginning to catch on that they can't operate with impunity the way they did just a few years ago. So it, it's, um, um, it, it is a journey. It is, you know, legal advocacy is important. The work that you do is important. Um, and, and the work, you know, once, once a company like Chevron has really internalized these kinds of, of, of um, they're basically, management systems ultimately, right? Um, that changes the, the debate. It, it no longer is an outrageous thing to demand of a company. Uh, Hewlett Packard um, voluntarily started tracing I its minerals in, uh, uh, um, uh, that, that it sourced in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And then when there was a similar provision introduced into the Dodd-Frank legislation, companies complained, oh, we can't do this. What do you mean you can't do this? Hewlett Packard is doing it already. So it changes the nature of the debate. Sorry, that was a long-winded answer, but it was a really foundational question. Yeah. And I think building on that, one of the biggest sort of trends we've, um, we've seen and we try to explore in our work is you know, there's a sort of public governance rule of law right. space which is constantly evolving and changing. The sort of corporate governance space mm -hmm. and sort of both voluntary corporate action as well as you know, sort of investor influence. But I think what's you know, very new you know, in the last sort of, you know, couple of decades is the sort of the civic governance aspects of, you know, sort of citizen action um, that are, um, you know, in many cases being a key pressure point mm -hmm. on getting um, you know, particular companies to move and, and then, you know, rule of law 
uh, you know, catches up on you know, the, the obesity mm -hmm. situation, I think, is a, a good mm -hmm. example, where it was, you know, a lot of civic activism, activism and you know, civil rights groups and everything, and, and public health groups who were pushing and non-governmental organizations. <laughs> And we're now, you know, seeing more and more pressure on companies to, yeah, you know, exactly. who are responsible in that area yeah, to address right. that, and where the regulations will come in. Who knows? Yeah. But. Please. Angeline, um, I just wanted to ask a question then, because now governments are also imposing um, that corporates have to do CSR. Mm -hmm. So you can see that India now imposes the two percent, mm -hmm. which is. Uh, if, for my view, is a failure of government to do their part, and mm -hmm. now imposing on companies to do mm -hmm. the work that they should be doing. Mm -hmm. So I, I want your view on this, and whether governments are starting to do that, right? I mean, impose, like, I think South Africa, 0.5%, and whether this is going to catch on, where governments are actually asking companies mm -hmm. to do the part that they can't do. Sure, yeah. I mean, it's a, it gets back to this sort of debate about it, it's not just about the money you're spending, but it's about what you're doing and the quality of it. And, and we had a, a conversation about a month ago, actually, here at the Kennedy School with a, a number of students. Chloe was there. You know, where does that line, this, the line between sort of corporate responsibilities and, and the sort of public service, or, you know, what is often, you know, for, you know public service delivery, and we call so, sort of social investment, where does that line stop and where do the responsibilities of governments for the, that real public service delivery end, you know? And I think it's, Depending on where you are, it shifts, and, and I think it's quite easy to say, okay, you know, corporations, you, you can you can take more of that on. I think in the, you know, I think even in Nigeria, we uh, companies are required to spend a certain percentage of money and put it into a development fund. Now, the management of that is not necessarily the most uh, effective. I'm just going to use that word. Um, and it is so, for somebody. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sort of an equivalent of this. So we're doing all this other work that we have more oversight over. So um, it's not really the answer to your question. I mean, I think it's a really important one. And I, I don't know what's going to be accomplished by by legislating at the percentage. I mean, maybe it's for, I mean, it's for us, it's normal. I think we spend a greater percentage than that. Um, the Indian legislation doesn't impact us because we don't we don't have bins in India right now. But um, it's certainly a debate. I mean, we, it was a big portion of a, a meeting that I went to recently about companies that are in India and what does this mean for them and how is this reported. But where does that money go? And is it just the companies who are spending it, or is it going into a pot? And there's a big debate about kind of the right way to do it. I, I don't. I think I need clarification on what the two percent is, and is it is it like a tax that's collected and held by the government, or is it something, is it they have to invest a certain no, amount? No, it's the companies are required yeah. to spend um, that amount on on social projects. And I think, in part, um, the oh. cause of that is that the taxation capacity of the Indian government is so poor um, that if they were to collect the taxes, the same amount of money would never reach the intended targets. Oh, yeah, and I, I think that yeah. has to be taken into yeah. account uh, yeah. in that particular situation. But then are you off the hook? I mean, is but, the uh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't contribute to governmental capacity, capacity building, building, which, yeah. which is, which is wh why it's yeah. you know, so weak in the first place. Yeah. 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 But it appears that if the, if the, I understand that there's a very good point about it doesn't contribute to the governmental capacity However, it appears that if the corporation is moving into an, an area that is inhabited by people and all the entire environment that exists there, and they will be adjusting and changing it, that there should be mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. an investment that can stabilize and aid the adaptation and not just build a building. That's not right. the concept. Right. Those are the specific examples. It's right. the, the concept is to um, add value to the environment instead of just a job, no. which is, you know. No. Well said, yeah. yeah. But I think the main thing is that then you are assuming that the companies will know what to do, yeah. right? That which and that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which, yeah. And we don't, you, know, you can see they get it wrong a lot of the yeah. time and then yeah. they figure it out. Part of that legislation is that the companies are supposed to do this in conjunction with civil society. Yeah. But, uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. It's just, it's a new, it's a new law. It, in some ways, it's actually a step backwards because it sort of pushes things back into the philanthropy. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah. yeah, because the criteria, the, the, the yeah. details of how you fulfill your last 2% or whatever, I think, are a lot of around. Yeah. 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 Hi, Susan Pronto. So 
I, I work um, with uh, Human Rights NGO, and um, one of the things we're trying to work on is this corporate accountability. So I was very interested when you said that, or in the film, the, the guy says at Chevron, we're going to teach the communities how to negotiate so they, because actually that's some of the work we're trying to do with civil society organizations is to build their capacity to be equal negotiators. So I guess I wanted to hear a little bit more about, this is sort of a teaser in the <coughs> film, about how that really worked and what was the process and, and how well did the communities, you know, obviously learn the negotiation, how trusting were they of that relationship and whether you think that's something that other companies are doing and it's a replicable kind of partnership capacity strengthening activity. Sorry. Yeah, well, I, I, um, actually, um, please take one of these. I will. Because one of the, the, the this originally was a 35 minute uh, mm -hmm. video which we, uh, uh, cut down, and one one of the things that that we sort of uh, cut down on is the role of mediation. Yeah. Um, they actually um, uh, Chevron and the communities tried to negotiate several times, and it didn't work until uh -huh. they brought in a respected um, uh, mediator. The, oh, okay. He actually was in the video okay. from the from the New Nigeria Foundation. Oh, okay. So he was the mediator. He was the mediator. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it. And, this, yeah, and they've been so renegotiated. Like yeah. Member that both, both the yeah, and, and then uh, you know, talk about the renegotiation. Right, so it's, the, really I mean, interesting. It, yeah. it's not just one time and then they're going to go, these, they're, the GMOUs are renegotiated every three years, I believe, yeah. which also, too, I think, um, and, and there's also been a very extensive participatory stakeholder evaluation process pulling in thousands and thousands of the stakeholders, whether the members of these regional development councils or, um, or those who are the true sort of beneficiaries in the communities to say, okay, you know, how is this going, what are your feelings, and, and really learning about some of the challenges with making sure that the right, that there were, it was diverse and representative in the community, so I think there were concerns that women weren't necessarily represented as much. They had separate meetings. They're not represented so, in that video you know. very well. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a baby editing. But, um, uh, so, I mean, I think it's, it's an iterative process. It continues to be, um, and, and I think we've, we're pulling in lessons from that even evaluation process to now look at our, the Niger Delta Partnership Initiative work and, I'm working with some other folks to say, okay, let's pull in these stakeholders again and, and talk through kind of where we are and where we're going. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, my name is Claudia Palmer. I'm a partner in the Gucci Consulting Firm in Dubai, and we work with companies that want to expand and um, change their operations in the Middle East and Africa. So I come, I always have a hard time with CSR. I come from business. So so I do have a degree from the Kennedy School. I've spent all of my professional life in either strategy consulting or corporate in the commercial operations side. Um, and CSR always seems to be somewhat separate and removed from the actual business and what companies actually do in business. And, oh, and it's also even being used as kind of an offset mm -hmm. for the business operations rather than changing the way business is actually conducted. I mean, you have new business models up there. And that's and a lot of the projects I work in, I do a lot of work with the pharmaceutical industry. That's also where I was in corporate. The question is, do we even go into Africa in some places in the Middle East? Do we even make our products available for all the difficulties of that environment? And then I, most companies are very stuck to a particular business model, which is not necessarily feasible in that environment. And pharma being pharma, of course, also you cannot change the product. That avenue is not there's a lot of regulation even in those environments, so they, they have a fairly rigid space to operate in. Uh, so I'd be interested in terms of research and your experiences in both what are, are possible new business models in, in, rather than CSR, and also how to move companies in their thinking because the commercial side <coughs> isn't there. It, it certainly is not there. They still think it's like we hand it over to the policy and CSR people and they're going to fix it, whatever it is, and we'll just do business as usual. The Unilever video is exactly on that subject, but Jane, okay. you, you perhaps a quick response. Yeah, we're, we're I think a, jump into a, that a quick response. I think there, there are two things there. One is you're just the framing of CSR. It's a, frankly one of the biggest challenges in this area. You know, last week I was at the Social Enterprise Conference at the Business School, 200 people using the framing social. Enterprise. Two days ago I was in New York with Michael Porter and there was 400 people at the Shared Value Summit. Oh. Next week, the World Bank is hosting on something on business and sustainability. So what, you know, one of the challenges is even the term CSR, 
we define CSR as this whole spectrum. Yeah. A lot of people think CSR exactly. is just I, I, I try to stay away from it quite yeah. Yeah. And, and, I want to do this based on the right way <laughs> rather yeah. than doing yeah. CSR. Yeah. Yeah. There's an ongoing debate here at the Kennedy School whether we change the name of our initiative for that reason because oh. we could say it will be blue in the face, well, we look at CSR as this whole thing. But there, you know, there isn't a term that everyone is comfortable with. So, you know, as far as we're concerned, whatever you call it, in fact, when we teach, we have the, the, the covers of the reports of six major energy companies. Mm -hmm. And one is called citizenship, one is called CSR, one is called corporate you know, responsibility, another is called sustainability. <laughs> so what we say is, you know, it's fundamentally about you know, managing, identifying, avoiding, mitigating, and you know, managing the social and environmental risks. And then you know, some philanthropy, yes, but ideally over time, you know, creating shared value through the business. Doing business the right way. Yeah. And doing business the right way. Which, you know, and you know, a lot of the doing the business the right way is, you know, even the legal compliance, you know, it sounds so simple and you know, you'd know better than anyone. If you're operating in 180 countries, just doing the legal compliance, um, you know, and, and even if the laws are there, they often aren't implemented because of government capacity constraints. So that you know, doing business the right way is the foundation of I mean, all the work that's being done on corporate governance in, in, in the Gulf area at the moment is a great example of you know sort of foundational stuff that is here, and then you know, a little bit of this, but then you know, how do we increase bringing it into the core business, which is what Unilever is trying to do, and you know, how do we make the risk management just so much more strategic, building the capacity of communities and NGOs to be you know, um, you know sort of stronger, um, you know um, both partners but also activists. Um, and, you know, and also, you know, strengthening rule of law on the risk management side. So, uh, um, you know, but, I, but, but on the business model side, you're absolutely right in that it's, you know, it's, it's still a very big challenge, particularly for the big multinationals, which is why social enterprises are bubbling up everywhere, because they're developing new business models from scratch, but they have the problem of scaling. <laughs> And so, you know, big multinationals have scale, but they don't have the business model. And again, pharma might be a particular case, but the social enterprise does not, does point, have access to, to the R&D. Yeah. 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 So Abbott, Abbott Laboratories, who we work with, yeah. and we were just talking with last week, you know, they're still doing a lot here, you know, they're having to do stuff there, obviously, for obvious reasons, they're having to do the risk management, but they are you know, working on a number of, um, sort of shared value models, both some new R&D on trying to take some of their core products and through packaging, distribution, and, and sort of pricing models, get them to the you know, the base of the economic pyramid. They have, um, they've got a very big as a pro nutrition business. They're trying to do sort of local um, supply chains in India with dairy farmers in India, so that they're actually doing local supply and manufacturing in India, you know, of, of products that they're you know, normally importing. So, so those are some examples. And you know, Pfizer and Merck are doing some similar things. Novartis. Um, um, you know, got a, a you know, major project in, also in India, which they're spreading out to Africa, where they've set up a social business unit within the company to, to try and develop these new business models. Well, I, I guess the question is also how do you engage mm. the operational business leaders rather than yeah. CSR or yeah. compliance yeah. or yeah. 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 governance yeah. or whatever yeah. 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 It's got to be it's part yeah. of their yeah. everyday. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's yeah. cultural yeah. shift within yeah. companies yeah. 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 over time. Yeah. 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 Yeah, they're yes. not there. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely not. The incentives aren't there yet. No, yeah. but getting there. Yeah. Yeah. Vinia or Jennifer. Yeah. Hi, my name is uh, Mavina Belmonte. I'm the UNICEF representative in Malaysia and Brunei, and a um, mid-career graduate from 2009. Um, and the environment that you're describing is very much the environment that we have in Malaysia. You have a government like in India that strongly promotes um, CR, as it's called in. Uh, in Malaysia, and uh, but, but it's not that. In, in fact, uh, companies are are asked to report on whether they do it or not. There isn't an enforcement as there is uh, the expectation in India, but the enforcement is a question: Do you do you do it or not? Yes or no? And so those who want to report uh, actively do, and those who don't don't. But there is a there is a common consens consensus that there's a vested interest in private enterprise to, to do this, and not the charity way, but the business, the value chains way. And so we've, we've um, dovetailed off the work that you've done for the Global Compact, and we have something called Child Rights and Business Principles that we promote in a number of countries. And it is about value chains, and it is about risk management. And there's one company in particular, which is a Malaysian-based multinational, that is really on board. They talk about child protection that they're in the palm oil plantation business. Um, and they talk about child protection in a way sometimes almost better than, than we do because they, they know their business model and they see how, how 
how it works. I invite you actually to, to come and take a look. Because yeah. the other side is, yes, there are the, the big companies, but 80% of the Malaysian economy is based on SMEs. Yeah. And that's true for many countries. And so you've got SMEs looking at this and, and saying, well, how do we do this? And yeah, it's easy for you, Chevron. It's easy for you, our corporate partner in Malaysia. But what about us? You know, we're 15, 20 people. And how do you translate it in that kind of environment? The willingness is there. So what we've done with them is we work um, through something called the Companies Commission of Malaysia. If you're a private enterprise in Malaysia, you register with them. And, um, and we do sort of practical things. Um, business, business and government understand that women have to stay longer in the workforce. Right now, there are more women at university than men, but they drop out of the workforce to have children, and they all come back. So some of the things that we do are things like, well, if you're in a, pro in a small enterprise, how would you start a crash? How would you do create an environment that invites women back? And we're just doing an evaluation of how, how effective that outreach has been with SMEs to see, yes, there's the big business, but there's the sort of backbone of the economy as well. Yeah, that's where most people work. Yeah. You know, I suggest we jump into the Unilever thing. It's only four minutes long. Then we can, we can, we can yeah. just combine yeah. 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 We, yeah. 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 because and there's such yeah. overlap. Yeah. yeah, and then picking up your point, one of the things is that, you know, the leadership from, from the CEO level. And so this, this Unilever video is actually often what the CEO is doing. And I think most of you know Unilever is pretty big. I mean, two point Two billion people, just over two billion people use a Unilever product every single day around the world in about you know, 190 countries. And Paul Pullman, when he came in as CEO, um, you know, sort of decided to you know, shift from here, you know, still do these, but really look at how I mean, you could bring the sort of sustainability more to the heart of corporate strategy. And in November uh, 2012, they launched the Unilever Sustainable Living Plan. Um, you know, which really is aiming to do exactly what you were asking. So, and it's a more sort of swish video of, of, of Paul Pullman. Um, um, and two, two, two quick points. Um, Paul um, Pullman, the CEO of Unilever, is insulted if somebody calls this corporate responsibility. Yeah, yeah. He is absolutely determined that it's a new business model. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and secondly, the first thing he did when they launched the sustainable living plan is to stop issuing quarterly earnings targets. <laughs> yeah. And the stock did drop initially. It's it's not it's trading at its 52-week high. I checked it earlier today. They're doing they're doing pretty well. And this was a video just from a couple of weeks ago when they did their update. Okay, what do I need to do? Oh, I'm okay. Hey, there's so seven billion people on our planet and growing. The Earth's resources are under immense strain. We're living in a world where increasingly temperatures are rising, water is scarce, energy expensive. Food supply is uncertain, and the gap between rich and poor increasing. We cannot close our eyes to the challenges that the world faces. Business must make an explicit, positive contribution to addressing them. I'm convinced that we can create a more equitable and sustainable world for all of us by doing so. But this means that business has to change. At Unilever, we've set out a clear vision to double the size of our business, whilst reducing our environmental footprint and increasing our positive social impact. The Unilever Sustainable Living Plan is a blueprint for sustainable growth. Three years into our plan, we're proving that there is no contradiction between sustainable and profitable growth. We are seeing increasingly how sustainability drives growth of our brands, reduces our costs, and manages our risks. We are learning how taking a long-term approach not only strengthens our business, but also our ability to make a positive contribution to society at the same time. Now, I'm pleased to say that in 2014, we are strengthening our plan with new commitments on social impact and stepping up in three key areas to drive further transformational change. The first one is climate change by helping to end deforestation. The second one, food security, by championing sustainable agriculture and smallhold farms. And then finally, water, sanitation, and hygiene, by helping more people gain access to safe drinking water, proper sanitation, and yes, hand washing with soap. Now, we are committed to playing our part in addressing these challenges, but we simply can't do it alone. Whether governments, businesses, NGOs, or citizens, we all have an important role to play now more so than ever. Every day I see more and more examples of 
how different people are coming together to tackle the challenges we face. And this gives me a great sense of optimism for the future. Please join us. And let's see the difference we can all make together. As Gandhi said, the future depends on what we do in the present. Thank you very much. emotional thing, yeah, you know, which can cause some skepticism. And yet, um, if you actually look at the sustainable living plan, there are these three components to it, you know, sort of health and wellness um, and nutrition, which is at the core of their products, um, you know, the environmental footprint, and then the livelihoods piece is about you know, particularly sort of smallholder farmers and distributors and women and human rights in their value chain. And the sort of the, the, the things that bring about the credibility to to me, and it, you know, it comes back to the Chevron video, the, the accountability piece in, the, in those um, sort of core areas that they've highlighted, they've actually got sort of over 60 very, very specific targets. And Paul was inspired by the Millennium Development Goals. You know, listening to him, he sounds more like a you know, UN guy than a sort of corporate CEO. But, um, but they've got sort of 60 specific targets, and they're beginning to measure um, both at the country level, but also at the brand level. You know, they've got obviously you know, some very, very major brands. Their brand managers are now having to report internally on their accountability for performance against those targets. And then the company is reporting externally every year now on how they're performing against those targets. So at one level, one can you know, be cynical, and you know, I was initially like, mm, this is way too ambitious, and a company shouldn't be doing these things. And, and now, you know, looking particularly in, in their sort of product ranges, you know, three years in, they're saying you know, every single year, we are reporting, including to their investors. So if you, look at, if you look at their annual report, they've got their financials, and they've got their indicators against this now in their annual report at the corporate level. You go to their India annual report, and they've got you know, the same reporting. So they, they're really beginning to bring in you know, both external transparency and reporting, but also holding you know, their senior managers to account you know, for, for delivering on, on, on these goals. Um, and then at the same time, sort of saying, well, you know, even if we deliver on all of them, and you know, the deforestation is a good example, they said even if we're working with all the, sort of the palm oil um, you know, suppliers in our value chain, which they're doing, you know, we are you know, one of the biggest consumer goods companies in the world, and we're just going to scratch the surface if our competitors aren't doing it. So then they went to the Consumer Goods Forum, which is all the major consumer companies with you know, something like $2.5 trillion um, in, in, in annual sales, and they got the Consumer Goods Forum, about sort of 20 companies, to make a commitment together on cutting down deforestation, um, so cutting down, <laughs> stopping deforestation, <laughs> cutting down trees, cutting, stopping deforestation in their in their in their supply chain, and and they you know so this group of companies has now made a commitment. It's very early days, and you know they might not reach the commitment. But again, they've put it out there publicly so that NGO activists, media, um, you know, governments can sort of say to them, well, you know, this is the commitment you made. Are you actually making it? So so there's you know, I, so I think there's this, you know, two, two key messages. One is putting the commitments out there and. You know, leaders at the CEO level, but you know, their, their um, chief financial officer is out there you know, talking to investors about, about these issues. They're putting it into internal um, you know, performance measures and, and, and metrics within the company. Um, and then they're also, through their business model in that sort of top quadrant of the matrix, innovating 
um, you know, sort of fortifying nutrition products. And in fact, you know, we work work with UNICEF amongst other companies, um, you know, to fortify food product products. You know, to ensure that their washing uh, liquids, etc., are using less water. And so they're you know, working absolutely through R and D, through innovation, to develop new products and services, and you know, sort of change the productivity and, and um, inclusiveness of their value chain. You know, to really try and bring it to the core business. And you know, they're still doing the philanthropy, they're still doing the other bits, but it's, it's one of the best examples we know of a company saying, you know, we're, we're really trying to do this much more as part of our core, um, your core business. And as John said, stopping giving um, quarterly earnings guidance because they're saying, you know, this stuff takes a long time. And I think it's easier for European companies to say, we're not going to give quarterly earnings guidance. Um, you know, and, but they're still being you know, monitored on their quarterly earnings, but, but being much more articulate that it's not just about embedding these issues into the core business, it's, it's also taking that long-term view, which is, I think, probably still one of the biggest obstacles to this going mm -hmm. to the mainstream is because of the investor perspectives being so short-term. So, so it's, you know, it's just one example, and you know, the, you know, there are very few where companies, the big companies, are embedding it more in their core business, but I think it's a trend you know, one's beginning to um, beginning to see, and I think the more you know activists are pushing for that to happen, and I mean, government incentives and reg you know regulations are there, the more we'll see see it happening. But um, but it's, it's and, to and to go back to the basic uh, issue of is this a business model or is it corporate responsibility? The uh, the original insight by Paul Pullman, shortly after he was uh, uh, main uh, CEO of Unilever, said, look. We're all competing for market share uh, in a market of two billion people. There are going to be nine billion people in the world before too long. We we want to we want to cater to four billion, and we cannot do it with our current business model. We have to invent a new business model, mm -hmm. and that's how this got started. Yeah, so what's yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> 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 class, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I wanted to this sort of, uh, to me there's this additional step, as you know, Jen, I think about this, um, that when I happen to be doing a review of a book on democracy, I'm looking at the history of several different countries, and one of the countries I'm looking at just as a case study is Nigeria. Um, and their, you know, the interpretation of, of the, uh, their analysis, which I think is not, you know, what I think is like, solid, basically saying that the, the oil wealth, not only Chevron specifically, or shallow Hoover, but that the oil wealth has just undermined the rule of law, and it's just created a, a Rontier government that is, you know, that then has not had any incentive to show the North, and you've got the Oberon, and you've got, you know, one of the highest poverty rates, um, and certainly for a country of this size. Um, and it seems to me that, that if, the, if the major actors, uh, and certainly one would have to say that Chevron is a major actor in Nigeria, um, if they're not, when it is, it is the wealth that they take responsibility for the other side of the wealth that they're generating to try to build rule of law. Because if those, it seems to me, as I say, that if those companies don't, who will? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, and, and it's a question of citizenship in the real sense of the word. And companies historically have adopted this, oh, we're guests in this country kind of line, um, that, oh, well, who are we, you know, to, um, you know, to influence this? But yeah, there was a major taxpayer, of course, and, and, and it's been present there, and has got how many employees. So, I mean, this is additional level of responsibility that does require collective action mm -hmm. for safety. Yeah. Yeah. But up to yeah. me, it's really, you cannot, you cannot develop, you cannot get rule of law, and if the companies sit on the sidelines, it's much harder to do that. I mean, it, this is, it's, it's so difficult because so often we are then in joint ventures with national oil companies yes. and we've signed production sharing agreements and there's all these sort of legal sort of morass that I think we, not morass, a lot of you can probably speak better than I can in terms of swamp, swamp, but, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and it gets to the issue of leverage, I mean, and, and that word is used a lot when it comes to supply chains and all sorts of other issues. Um, and, and I think yeah, I mean, I, I actually, you know, I've thought about the, the potential power collective action when it comes to this, the CSR, whatever you want to call it, working in the Delta. Shell has taken that GMOU model and they're doing it themselves. I mean, gosh, why couldn't we all just get together and do work on this, to, you know, in a better way? Unfortunately, I, you know, I've been in the industry long enough. I think there's still a competitive issue with your peers and you still need that PR bump and you still need that Chevron flag to wave. But, and that doesn't answer your question completely, it's, I think, yeah, but it's really it's fundamental. fundamental. It is policy yeah. and rule of law yeah. 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 
and not just be, you know, shoved aside in order well, to And, and for the post-2015 development discussions, we, companies are saying governance, rule of law needs to be on the table. Now, a lot of governments are pushing back on that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah. who's going to push back? Yeah. Who's yeah. Yeah. Where's the power? And then one? that's where I think you know, one interesting area, and, and particularly in the oil and gas and mining revenue sharing that we are seeing, there's obviously the extractive industries transparency, which was the first yes. step of being, let's just be transparent. But now what we are seeing, um, in fact, there's a meeting in Washington about next week, is, is the whole thing of, you know, sort of benefit sharing. And, and I think there's a great role for the World Bank and the IMF to be playing and the UN in, um, you know, sort of, where you're trying to, you know, if not push the governments, build the capacity of the governments again yeah. to do it better, because you know, that can't be the company's role. Not but even. then can the companies work collectively? And, and, and in Tanzania, where there's obviously billions of dollars going to oil, gas, and mining, and a lot of concern is this going to yeah, have very negative impacts there, they are trying to do some sort of collective action efforts where the, you know, the industry is coming together. But they've asked, and it comes back to your question about mediation, they've asked, um, and I think it's UNDP, I could be wrong about that, to sort of act as the convener. <laughs> Um, for the companies and government and the donors to come to the table. Um, and so it's not so much about rule of law, but about better sort of um, you know, capacity building and decision making on development impact. I think we're seeing um, you know, sort of the, the anti-corruption coalitions that are beginning to emerge in, in a number of places. Uh, another example of that, I mean, you've been, you know, you've you personally played a, played a key role in that. So, so I, 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 you know, so one's seeing it, I, you know, the rule of law if GE and um, you know, Transparency International have had a partnership on it. It is, you know, the, it's interesting that companies aren't more outspoken about it. Where um, you know, it, it is a problem, well, and, and I think, it, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 yeah. And, and and I think also, I mean, the, you know, one of the big elephants in the room, and you know, you'll hear Larry Summers talk about this, is your know, corporate taxes, right. and that wasn't seen as a corporate responsibility issue, you know. A few years ago, and then you know, and it was you know, Starbucks not paying their taxes in the UK that started it. But you know, mm -hmm. the whole question on transparency of taxes and, and, and actually you know, paying taxes where they should be paid, and what does that actually mean? So that's going to be another big question in this area, where I think you're going to need sort of levels of collective action. So, so the you know, to me that you know, there's a sort of the individual um, you know do no harm model. There's the individual let's start integrating this into our business strategy model. <laughs> And then a lot of these issues are going to be collective action. They are collective action problems, and business hasn't really come to the table in that way. Whether it's you know access to healthcare and health system strengthening, or rule of law and corruption, but are you know some of the leaders are beginning to do that, and we're beginning to see mechanisms emerging, which is where again I think you know all of what you folks are doing, the work of the Kennedy School is so important. We often get asked, well, why is this a corporate initiative at the Kennedy School? And it's for that very reason that it's, you know, it, it's how, does, how do business leaders solve these problems in cooperation with government, civil society leaders, international agency leaders? Well, it's going to be a big, I think, big, big issue of the future. I know we're about to run out of time, but we have oh, a couple sorry. of quicker ones. No. Well, well I was just sort of going to ask just really quickly, so where, where do you come out on sort of the publishing of contracts? Yeah. Um, because, oh, I mean, at least in Afghanistan, where, where we're also doing some work, you know, we sort of joined up with some of the local NGOs there to yeah. really push for some of the, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. publishing of that. I just be yeah. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a <laughs> as you would know better than I do, it's, it's a complex. very, very tough one. I mean, I, I don't, you know, we've, we've obviously seen the analogy in the apparel sector, uh, you know, the apparel companies, Gap and a few others beginning to uh, you know, publish their, you know, do their suppliers mm -hmm. on. Um, I think we're way off from that in the extractive sector and probably all sorts of, you know, very, very clear reasons. I think the European oil companies are moving there faster, and again, mm -hmm. you know, not surprising given the you know, difference in legal environments. But um, <coughs> you know, I, I think we're we're away from that. But it, it certainly, is, as you would know, something that the, um, the Extractive Energies Transparency Initiative is, yeah. is, is, is looking at. Yeah. And, uh, well, also, and the, the, ways, yeah. the International Finance Corporation, where it is a co-investor, yeah. uh, it now requires oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. published yeah. contracts. Yeah. 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 Uh, with, with certain, you know, uh, absolutely um, critical things redacted. Redacted, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. But you don't the, need to read it all. You just need to read the few yeah. pieces that, yeah. as civil society, you need to know what the yeah. deal is. Yeah, yeah. Reading that direction. Yeah, I was just going to, yeah. so when, when Paul Pullman took over as the CEO of Unilever, he told his investors, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to invest in this. If you don't like that, I don't want you as a shareholder. Yeah. And he was only able to do that because shareholders are beginning to demand that responsible practices in the portfolio companies, largely through 
like CalPERS and the you know, uh, Canada Pension Fund, big pension funds that really move the market on, on these portfolios. Um, so to what extent is, is that you know, responsibility among shareholders driving change in companies these days? Well, large institutional investors have, have been pushing on this front for a long time. Um, but so much of the market is determined by short-termism, particularly in this country. But it, I mean, Paul Pullman wouldn't, wouldn't have survived if he were CEO. And even, even as an Anglo-Dutch company, he said he made all of the critical decisions in the first month because he figured they couldn't fire him that fast. And yeah, the, again, it's like it's such a long way to go. The, the, um, yeah, the um, work sounds good. Um, there's a, um, the, the, the social, a social accounting standards board, which is trying to sort of set up similar, um, you know, sort of uh, technical standards for assessing social and environmental impact on a sector by sector basis, mm -hmm. so that you know you've got, uh, you know, we have very clear financial accounting standards. So a lot of the financial analysts are saying, okay, well, even if we were going to look at this stuff, uh, how do we, how do we compare? How do we analyze? So Mike Bloomberg has just. Um, Join that as the chair, which is quite an interesting, you know, um, take on it. So yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's called um, SASB, so S A S B. If you can see that. Uh, yeah. Okay. And Mary Shapiro joined as vice chair from yeah. the SEC. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's a power lineup. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that's going to. Re it's going to. To me, I think it's going to be a, ch a game changer. And the World Bank just is. I uh, guess it's the, the coalition of um, exchanges. The World. Yeah. Uh, they the, the announced they're going to ask the stock exchanges yeah. to require. Companies that list on their exchanges to use um, the integrated reporting or the SASB standards. Yeah. Which again, I think is a great example of your stock exchanges of, of, of private sector entities, most of them. And yet, you know, so once they start saying you can't list on our stock exchange until you do that, you start you know, getting that transformational shift that, 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 that is needed. So, so I think I, I, I think what we have to do is I know some people are needing to probably start moving out. So maybe we should wrap up and then we'll certainly happily stay around for um, further conversation. Uh, yeah, uh, we don't want to yeah. stand between people and, yeah. and, and, and wine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, there's a reception <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> yes, I hope it just sort of gives you an idea of um, what we're trying to do. And I think at the end of the day, you're so much of the whole Kennedy School campaign is around you know, sort of leadership. And, yeah. and you know, sort of, to me, these sort of three dimensions of leadership are emerging. There's a sort of the individual leadership, sort of cross boundary, or what Joe and I would call tri sector leadership, where you've got a Paul Pullman you know, speaking as he is, or you've got you know, someone like Rebecca working you know, in, in different sectors. I think we've got more and more of that, and so many of you are examples of that. There's a sort of the institutional leadership, where it's sort of been a vanguard in every single sector, I think, of you know, 10, 20 companies who really are ahead and then all the laggards behind them who are not doing much. And I think that, you know, and we're going to need more of that institutional leadership, but it's the sort of almost like interconnected collective leadership models or platforms like stock exchanges, like groups of companies working together, such as the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative or the Consumer Goods Forum, which are, you know, going to, I hope, transform us to a, you know, a, a, a much more um, you know, sort of strategic level where the, you know, both the social and environmental risks are embedded as well as you know, the opportunities more likely to be recognized. So you know, it's still a lot of work. I think a lot of companies are, are still at the traditional philanthropy side. There's the SME challenge. There's the bad governance or weak governance challenge. So there's you know, so many issues. And yet I think um, you know, the, the, the concept of business integrating and embedding social and environmental risk um, and, and managing its externalities, its negative externalities, and trying to sort of embed um, you know, value creation on the social environment side is, is here to stay, I think, and it's just a question of you know, how, how far it will go. So, so thank you very much. Thank and you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.